Hi and welcome to the Atheist Alliance International Podcast with me, Andy Phillips, and today I'm joined by Daryl Ray, who's a psychologist and author of The God Virus, How Religion Infects Our Lives and Culture, and also Sex and God, How Religion Distorts Sexuality. He's also a founder of the non-profit organization Recovering from Religion, as well as the Secular Therapy Project. Now today we're going to be looking at secular sexuality and the treatment of religion-induced trauma. Hi Daryl, how are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. No problem, no problem. I've been looking forward to this one actually because it's uh, it's something which I think a lot of people don't really think about if they're outside of the situation. You know, and we, you know, some of the things we're going to talk about is things like um, religious trauma syndrome and stuff like that, and it's a very, very real thing. So. I think where we should start really is to just give, if you can give a little rundown of what recovering from religion is all about, and then we can maybe go into talking a bit more about the the concepts of trauma and things like that. Sure, sure. Well, recovering from religion, uh, we started in 2009 um, as an organization to help people deal with, with issues of uh, uh, belief, disbelief and doubt and uh, the consequences, you know, like leaving leaving a religion. And we've grown for these 11 years, uh, pretty much on a hundred percent growth rate for the last three years. It's, it's been hard to keep up with, but uh, we have a call line. We have a chat line and people can call into us and talk to us about, about anything related to religion and their, their journey. And we're not a deconversion or a conversion organization. We're just there to listen. Our, our volunteers are very well trained to be good listeners and ask good questions. And then we can help direct people to therapeutic resources if they need more than just simply someone to talk to. Uh, we have a whole wide range of services we offer and, and every service we offer is free. We don't charge anything for anything we do. Uh, the therapists charge, but they're just part of our, our database of therapists. But finding a therapist, uh, our service for helping you find one is free as well. So it's just a, a large, uh, over 200, over 200 volunteers, uh, most of them working many hours a month, uh, trying to provide support and service to anybody on the planet. Literally anyone on the planet who's got an internet connection can talk to us, now, or and they can call in. Well, we got a direct phone line from the United Kingdom, from South Africa, from Australia, from New Zealand, Canada. You can call in from those countries, but you can chat in from any any country. We get, get a lot of chats from places like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, even. It's kind of dangerous for people, but we have some protocols to help protect people. Yep. So what, were, what are the major sort of uh, issues that you come across Moses on? Because obviously people who are thinking of leaving a religion, and one of the questions I, I did want to ask just to sort of kick off with this is uh, there are going to be some people who still have a belief in God, for instance, they may still have a deep-rooted belief in God, but want to either get out of their religion or have have got out of their religion. You know, they've they've left their community behind, and we could talk, I want to talk a little bit about some of the struggles that people have. But do you do you often talk to people who are definitely away from God? They've they've put a line under God. They don't believe in God anymore. So atheists, in other words, mm-hmm. or do you speak to people who? still have a belief in God, but have need some sort of help to ostracize themselves from the religion that they're in? Well, we'll talk to anybody. Uh, we call it the spectrum of belief and disbelief. If you just think of it like a, a scale of, say, one to one to 10, uh, a 10 being somebody who's 100% beliefs in God and religious, and a one is a 100% atheist, it's a spectrum and people can be anywhere on that spectrum and, and we're happy to talk to them. And like I said, we're not here to deconvert you. We're not, we're not here to push you one way or the other on that spectrum. So, but, but many, when people call us, they're oftentimes, they oftentimes want to leave their religion, but they want to, don't want to leave their God, you know, whatever God they have, they, they may still want to keep that. And we're happy to listen to them, talk to them. We'll even send them back to church or a mosque. We'll, we'll help them find a new religion if they think that's what they need. Uh, because we a long time ago 
learned, and we've known this for decades, that you can't argue somebody out of a religion. You, so because they didn't get into that religion logically, they got into it often, almost all the time they got into it as a result of childhood indoctrination. So we try to just help people. We try to meet people where they are. They're still a God believer. That's great. No problem. If they still want to go to church, we have we have atheists that say, I'm, I'm, I got a conflict. I want to keep going to church, but I'm an atheist now. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> and we have ministers. We literally have ministers chat in with us and uh, say, I, I, I preach from the pulpit every Sunday and I'm, I'm an atheist now. What do I do? And of course, in that case, we would refer them to another organization, our sister organization, the Clergy Project. Um, but any anybody can talk to us about anything. We interact with thousands, thousands of people uh, every month, practically. So, I mean, if you count all the website connections, all the resource uses, all the phone calls, all the chats, thousands of people are interacting with us every month to uh, to try and go somewhere in their journey. And we're just here to help them along whatever journey they want to have. We'll see. Now, that pisses that pisses some quote, hard atheists off, I know. They, yeah. they think yeah. everybody should be an atheist. Uh, you know, I may believe everybody shouldn't be an atheist, but that doesn't mean I'm right. I mean, they they have to do their journey their way, period. Well, the bottom line is it's not about, it's not about them. It's about the actual person who's going through that, that, that system, that trauma system. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the, the concepts of um, religious trauma syndrome, how, what, what you see that as a concept. So people can understand this, because if people sure. are listening to this, you know, it's good to define exactly what that is and the effects right. it can have. Well, uh, let me go back about 10 years when uh, Dr. Marlene Winnell coined the term religious trauma syndrome. She wrote a book, actually an excellent book that a lot of our clients uh, find helpful. It's called Journey, um, um, Leaving the Fold. And she has a website called Journey Free, and we recommend those resources. But she turned, she noticed as she was working, she's a psychologist, and she noticed that as she was working with people leaving religion, that they they exhibited a lot of the same symptoms that, say, a soldier coming back from Afghanistan is exhibiting, or the same symptoms of somebody who'd been through a, a traumatic experience like an earthquake, uh, or or some other major you know, upset in their, in their environment. And she started looking at the symptoms and comparing the, the list of symptoms, you know, here's the list of symptoms somebody goes through when they've been, they've seen their buddies get killed by an IED in, in Afghanistan. And here's the list of symptoms she's seeing in people who were raised in a Jehovah's Witness or raised in a Muslim family. And when those two lines of those two lists of symptoms, so to speak, line up, and you can see there's a cluster of symptoms. For example, the inability to sleep uh, because of thought disturbances, true on both sides. Uh, hypervigilance, the fact that a, a firecracker goes off and the person who was in Afghanistan hits the floor, even though it's just the 4th of July in the United States. That, that would be an adaptive, an adaptive behavior in Afghanistan but it's it's so it's inappropriate here. Well, the same thing can happen on the on the religious side. That the religious person sees a religious icon or a symbol, and it triggers them into uh, an emotional breakdown or emotional upset of some kind. So we could go through the list uh, of symptoms, and she noticed that people who were raised in certain kinds of religious regiments generally higher control, but not always, high control or high control religions had clusters of symptoms that look a lot like trauma. And since that time, we've established that in fact, it is trauma. It's, and it was caused by very early exposure to high control abuse. Uh, now, the parents themselves didn't think they were abusing their kids, but they were. Uh, so, Number one, kind of answer your question is there is a such thing as trauma. We can understand it when we look at it in comparison to other well-documented aspects of trauma. And, and remarkably, the treatments are very similar too. They're not identical, but they're they're very similar. There's a lot of a, a lot of things we can talk about, but I think one thing to start with 
a bit, Andy, is the the notion of childhood trauma, or or let's put it a little differently. You can go online. You can actually go online and take a little test put out by the American CDC, and it's called Adverse Childhood Experiences. It, it does not even list or, or mention Trump, uh, religion. So it's not even about religion. But what, what the American CDC has found through many years of research is there are certain childhood experiences, we, we call them adverse childhood experiences, that lead to childhood trauma. If you take this little test, I think it's only like nine or 10 questions, and you answer them, you may realize that you're a full adult, you're a 40-year-old person, and yet you're still exhibiting these symptoms that go right back to something you experienced in childhood. And it's, and it's important to remember that children's brains are developing. They're very vulnerable to, to environmental influences. So what <laughs> an adult in Iraq is exposed to an IED, a bomb or something, that's pretty traumatic, but it doesn't take that kind of trauma to traumatize a child's brain. Something as, as something like just getting a severe spanking may be enough to traumatize that child in some way for the rest of their life. I mean, ch children will get tra traumatized through childhood for lots of lots of reasons and things like bullying and yeah. um, being sent to Coventry by their friends and all those sort of things. I mean, it's yeah. it's sort of hard enough if you layer on something as deep as this. This is a, a much deeper trauma when you're ostracized or threatened with hell or armageddon whatever. exactly you know, right right it's a whole yeah. new level and it's your friends and your family that are doing this yeah right right we have people chat oh excuse me we have people chat in to us and we we've actually uh recently one of our clients said he he, he called it and he didn't say he had religious trauma syndrome he said i have uh apocalypse syndrome uh, or something like that, apocalypse, uh, oh, end, end of time syndrome or something like that. Well, he was raised in one of these end of time cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses. And he had, from the day he was born, he had a beat into him. The world's going to come to an end. Uh, when the when Jesus comes, everybody's going to go to heaven. And if you're not good, you're going to be left behind. So he had put it together himself. He didn't know anything about religious trauma syndrome, but he, he realized that that constant being told that, you are going to be left behind. And it, oh, and by the way, he had seen the movie Left Behind and other movies like that. We get that. Those movies traumatize kids. And so he would wake up. He, he's told us he remembered waking up many, many times at night. Can't find his parents. Maybe his parents stepped out of the house for some reason. And the parents aren't there. First thing that goes through his mind is they've left me behind. Jesus has come. They've left me behind. It, it, we, we had another example Well, he gave us the same example that he was uh, working. He, he had a woman, a, a woman friend who was working in uh, in an office building and they had a bomb scare and they, they evacuated all the buildings around this building she was in, but she didn't know it. They didn't bother her, find her to tell her to get out. Uh, when five o'clock came, she went to leave the building. There wasn't anybody there. So, she figured, well, everybody disappears at 4.59 around here anyway. She gets in her car and there's nobody in, in anywhere. There's no cars, there's no people. And, she, and the first thing that went through her mind is, I've been left behind. And she drives all the way home thinking, I don't have a family anymore. Jesus has condemned me to stay here. And when she gets home, there's her family. Everything's okay. But I mean, this over and over again, people have this, this fixation on the ideology of the religion that has been embedded since you were a, a young child. And it doesn't go away very easily without, without some help. And it, it can overtake your life. It can consume your life. If you're so scared of whatever it is, scared of hell, for example, you may spend hundreds of hours knocking on people's doors. If you're a Mormon or a Jehovah's witness, because you're afraid that, that fear drives a lot of behavior, very unproductive behavior that, that that gets in the way of you actually living a happy and complete life. It's, 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 do you think that the parents of children that are brought up in quite strict religious circumstances, 
do you think they actually have any clue that they are causing trauma to their children? Do, do you think it goes through their mind that they may be doing something that is provide or promoting this adverse childhood experience that you talk about? We, well, we've actually had the opportunity to talk to both sides of this equation, the children and the parents sometimes, because if you think about it, uh, there are a number of parents that ultimately realize they're in a cult and they leave too. Uh, there's actually a really good video. I just, I don't think I've got a link to it right now of, of a, of a child. He's an adult child. Now he's like 30 years old talking to his mother about that very thing. Mom, did you know you were traumatizing me? <laughs> and, really? uh, and her answer was, I feel really, really bad about what I did. But at the time, it was what I thought was right. It's the only thing I knew. People are doing the best. And, and here's, here's our philosophy, Andy. People are doing the best they can with the tools they have. The thing, the thing uh, that we, we hope people will do is when you know better, do better. Because you did this to your children when they were five years old doesn't mean you have to be you have to feel guilty the rest of your life. Once you figured out that was the wrong way to raise children or that you actually traumatize your children, don't re-traumatize yourself. You know, go talk to your kids, try and work something out and move on yourself as well. Because I'll tell you, once a parent realizes they have traumatized their own child, I mean, think about that. That is almost a traumatic, a, a traumatic thought in and of itself. And then you perseverate. You keep thinking about how could I do that to my child? How could I be such a horrible parent? And they start, they start running through new information and imposing that on the old, on the old system they were in. And, and the, the cognitive distance can tear you apart. So one of the things we we realize is you could be traumatized as a child, but once you leave religion. The, the dissonance and the conflict you feel inside of yourself and your mind can, re, can really create more trauma. Uh, and I think we see that in some of the parents. So that's the long answer to your question, Andy. I don't think most parents have a clue. They think they're doing the best, the right thing for their kids. And I don't, but, but I want to war, I want to give people good. I want to help people understand that you may have done something that in retrospect was bad, horrible even. But you were doing the best you could at the time. Forgive yourself, ask for their forgiveness, ne renegotiate your life, and and move on. And get some get some therapy if you if you need to. But don't keep blaming yourself for for what appears to be a bad decision or a bad behavior, uh, because it was the best. You you don't blame yourself. I think I think you're you're, you're right because I, I I can't see any parent doing harm to their children psychological harm to their children on purpose whether whether they're they're uh, within a, a, a quite strong religion a, a, a strong faith that has these specific rules and this is that this is what we think and this is how we act mm -hmm. i can't see parents actually being like that and i think the one of the, the 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 powers of doing things like these sort of podcasts is that hopefully someone in a religion who has brought up their children in a way that they thought was right may through reason start thinking that maybe what they did wasn't the best way of doing it. Um, so this is why I think the power of these sort of things, you know, getting, getting you on and talking about these sort of things quite openly is really important. Well, there if, are... they do, if they do watch this podcast and they listen to what you're saying and 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 take it on board because the first thing is to take it on board obviously yeah um, what what can they get in contact with you as well to talk about what they've done or what they think they may have done i would say on average we get one or two chats a day of people calling in or chatting in with us to talk about religious trauma or they, you know, it's, you don't want to self-diagnose. That's, that's not a, that's not very accurate. You may or may not have religious trauma. You, you need a professional to tell you that, but you can obviously realize that, Oh, my, the, the treatment I got from my parents is continuing to have trouble, have impacts on me. And I'm 30 years old now, 
that's not bad get to to come to realization so you can you can call in with us you can chat in with us and we can listen we can ask questions we can help you come to some preliminary conclusions we can point you to like the uh, adverse childhood experiences uh, survey you we can point you to that we can show you articles that will help you look at your own past and your own behavior and see if if trauma might be a part of it and then we can help you find a secular therapist a therapist that's vetted by us uh, we have 473 uh, vetted secular therapists all in seven different countries around the world and these therapists are guaranteed they will not pray to, with you and they're not religious they're not christian or muslim they're well trained in 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 the basic treatment methodologies and the most important thing is they're they're secular they, they have no hidden religious agenda that so many christian counselors have was, uh, again that's that's a, another sort of key issue here as well isn't it, it where when people do or are sent to therapy because of their behavior they're often sent to religious therapists or, or therapists that have a god belief and a religion um right it's normally in the same sort same sort of area isn't it it'd be a, it'd be a a christian therapist yeah. and of course that what they're going to do is to try and talk them back into the religion that and and uh, there's a, a real problem because a, a therapist who's who's deeply religious themselves probably is going to have a hard time even uh, accepting the notion of religious trauma syndrome let alone diagnosing it because they themselves don't think religion causes harm or it's only those extreme religions that cause harm. Well, let me tell you, we get a hell of a lot of Catholics, and that's the largest Christian religion on the planet. A lot of them come to us with what I would clearly say is religious trauma, because they were abused by a priest or by a bunch of nuns, and all sorts of, I mean, the whole Catholic religion is just an organization for sexual abuse. Even if you were never actually physically abused, the whole notion of purity culture and virgin births and you name it. I mean, you can't have sex before marriage. You name all the things the Catholics try to teach comes down to something that's really quite abusive because it's so unnatural. And people say, well, you just want to be, tell me, you just want to be an atheist so you can sin and have sex and all that sort of stuff. And I say, well, the most unnatural thing I can think of, the most perverted thing I can think of is a celibate nun or priest. That is, that is just crazy. And yet they don't see that at all. So a, a same thing of a Catholic therapist who who believes in a virgin birth. I mean, that that right right there says maybe you don't want to go to that if you if you experienced religious trauma or around, especially around your sexuality. We get so many LGBT people who were abused by their parents for being gay or abused because they were they were trans or, or you know or or just a natural kid who got caught masturbating at 12 years old. It, it's that simple. Every human being practically on this planet masturbates. And, and yet those religions will tell you that your body is your enemy and you should never, you should never engage in that kind of behavior because it's ungodly. Well, that's abuse. And it will lead to that. You, you'll lead to shame about your own body. It'll lead to shame about how you enjoy sex or even you, sh even if you should enjoy sex. Um, before or after marriage because it's, it, it, again it's the this this whole thing about going against natural behavior religions sort of suppress the concepts of natural behavior with their own view of why but the 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 point is that a lot of these things that you, i mean there's some of the stuff that you've talked about in the past and what you've written about is about suppressing just natural normal human behavior and not understanding why that happens you talk about things like you know uh, the gay community or trans people or um just the concepts of masturbation mm -hmm. you know i know you, you, you've spoken quite a lot about these sort of things just natural things that people do that are suppressed by religion and that causes trauma as well and that's sort of a it could be seen as a sort of a lightish sort of trauma compared with everything else i mean it's a boatload of stuff that goes on <laughs> yeah there is a boatload but but I want to narrow it down just a little bit because not everybody who was raised religious is traumatized. I was raised religious. I don't think I experienced any trauma. I, I experienced some bad ideas and those bad ideas influenced 
my life and my behavior in some bad ways many years ago. And I'm out of that. I'm over it. I'm not going to worry about that anymore. However, someone who was actually traumatized, who experienced some trauma, uh, is has the has the experience of having a what I call a change in the brain. Trauma, trauma creates a change in the brain. And that's the way to understand that's one of the ways to understand trauma. I can understand trauma by by looking at the symptoms. You know, I can't sleep at night. I can't get fear of hell out of my head. I can't get fear of Armageddon. Excuse me, Armageddon out of my head. I can't uh, stop thinking about the loss of my parents because they uh, they disfellowshipped me when I left the religion. Uh, I'm 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 constantly being reminded of religion and I can't get it out of my head. There's a whole list of these things that people people will experience. And if I could get inside of their brain, if I could do an MRI and, and examine how their brain is structured, I would probably see some some hyperactivity in something in like the amygdala. And I would see learning in the hippocampus that is is maladaptive learning. And I would probably, if I looked at their cerebral, uh, at, at their uh, adrenal cortex, I would probably see an adrenal cortex that's expanded um, because it's producing so much adrenaline or, and it continues to constantly produce adrenaline. So we can look inside somebody's body, inside their mind, and actually see they are constantly responding, in this case, inappropriately to their environment. Now, when I mean that, when I say that, I mean inappropriate. If if a if a lion or a hyena is about to get, eat me, <laughs> my brain and my uh, adrenal my um, uh, adrenal gland is going to produce all sorts of stress hormones that's going to help me run away or fight the tiger or the or the lion. So that is a very normal response. However, if I'm raised as a child from very early on, and I am spanked because I didn't get my Bible verses memorized properly. If if I am uh, isolated from all my friends because I didn't uh, want to go to Sunday school this week, or because I sassed my mother when she told me I'm going to hell for, for, <laughs> for whatever. If this is constant, then you're going to be hypervigilant. We call it hypervigilance your brain is going to be on high alert all the time because there's potential for danger. Think about this. Every time you turn around, if every time you turn around, there's a lion looking at you, chopping his lips and ready to eat you, you'd be on hyper alert all the time. Well, to a child, having a parent who is constantly watching them and and berating them and telling them, you know, they're going to hell or they're such a bad child or they need to be spanked. That's the same thing to a child. I mean, it doesn't, see, as adults, our minds don't process that way, but children's minds do. But day after day, year after year, in those formative stages from, say, two years old to 10 or 12 years old, the brain is being imprinted. It's being, it's being formed at those high those high anxiety, high anxiety, constant vigilance, and anxiety is a is a big part of, of religious trauma. Oftentimes, fear, big fear responses, but they're always there. It's it's an inappropriate response. Instead of instead of saying, "Well, that's just my aunt. She likes to talk about religion. I, I got an aunt like to talk about religion. I basically ignored her. She didn't bother me." But I know people who. I can't talk to my aunt because the minute she mentions God, it just sends me into a into a frenzy that I don't get out of for a week. Well, that tells me there's probably some trauma there because they're on hyper alert. They're inappropriately responding to normal stimulants, stimulation in their environment. You can't get away from God. It's everywhere. It's on the billboards, every church, on every corner. So if you're constantly being triggered by those things, it's a pretty good sign you got some kind of of trauma there because it, it, when it is a sort of a, a psychological manipulation but i think the truth of the matter is that the you can be told different things and you can take them on board or not but as a child you're obviously going to get um this information in whether it's like if you have jehovah witness about armageddon and always looking over your shoulder or that sort of thing or if you're a catholic being told you're going to go to hell if you do this 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 or this 
knowing these things, I think that the, the problem is obviously that those children 100% believe that that is true. And they believe it's true primarily because it's told to them by the people they love, you know, their family, right. their community, their church, everybody they know, everything around them. So their reality is that this is true. And I think this is this right. is why I think the reasoning behind the psychological damage is that they believe it's true. So they live with trauma through what they believe is a natural, the natural world. That's the way the world actually is. And that's what the mm -hmm. supernatural world is actually going to do to you. Right. You do right. These things. So that, that, and that so the deep it, you, you 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 align it with um, PTSD and, you know, what we used to call shell shock in the old days. Right. Right. Um, or battle fatigue, as it was upgraded to. So make in it World War II, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Could you tell me a little bit about the 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 sort of effects, the genuine psychological effects that actually happen to to these children as they grow up? Well, I think to kind of go back to your earlier point, I, I think it's important to understand how what's going on in child in children as their brains develop, and in a young child, uh, let's let's get let's go back in our history. Let's go back, um, you know, 30, 40,000 years, 70,000 years when we are hunter gatherers on the savannas of Africa. And we're we're uh, being taught by our parents how to stay safe. And our parents say, you don't go over there because that's where the hyenas, that's where the lions, that's where the cheetah might get you. And th that's a functional piece of knowledge that you better listen to. And the children that didn't listen to their parents aren't here to talk about it today. That's pretty simple. Uh, that's a pretty simple equation, if you will. However, if those same parents say, don't go over there because that's where the demons are. That's where the devil is. That's that will take you to hell. Don't associate with those people. Don't talk to Catholics. Don't read the book. Don't read the Quran. You know, whatever it is they're telling you not to do. Your little brain as a child doesn't know the difference. If I go, if I go over here, I get killed by lions. If I go over here, I get killed by the devil. The child knows no difference. So what religion has done is it's hijacked our brains. It's said, oh, we can take this natural and productive uh, fear of of your physical environment, lions and tigers, and we can transfer that to fear of devils and Satan and whatever else the religion wants to use. And then we can control the person. So it, it becomes the most sophisticated psychological control imaginable in some ways. Because like I said, the kids that didn't listen to their parents about the lions and tigers aren't here to talk about it today. And the kids who did are here to talk about it, but their brains are also susceptible to other bad ideas that appear to be real. I mean, when you're when you know nothing else, they appear to be real, and that's what's going on uh, in children's brains. So it it I wouldn't call it trauma yet at, at that point in time, but it's the beginnings of trauma when the person gets a bad idea that actually creates more problems in their environment. If you're so if you're so focused on staying out of hell and avoiding bad things like books, like the Catholic, you know, Catholic should have a whole list of books you can't read. So you're focused on not doing all these things. Those can have real world consequences when you start, look, you, you refuse to take a job because it might be too secular. Uh, you know, or you refuse to even look at a whole section of human beings that might be great partners, uh, life partners, sex partners, whatever, because they're not the right religion. There's real world consequences for bad ideas. And that can lead that can lead to trauma. One of the bad ideas is your own body is your enemy. I mean, Christians are really mm -hmm. good about that. So if you can if you can teach a kid your body is your enemy, how do you escape that? <laughs> I mean, that's a bad idea about your own body and you can't escape your own body. So you're stuck with this horrible shame or guilt or fear about natural, normal desires that you're going to have uh, sexually uh, for sure. But, but other things too, it could be eating, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that religions try to control.
Yeah, because it, 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 it's, it is about this this ostracization or rejection, um, and we know that loneliness causes. Trauma. Yes, absolutely. We got experiments going back uh, 40, 50 years with primates with monkeys. The Harlow experiments, yeah, showed that you know you isolate monkeys from their mother. There's just no almost no substitute for the mother, and it has permanent traumatic effects on the brain of the monkey. And we could, we if we had an MRI, we could probably see what's what's changed in the monkey. Remember, I said earlier, trauma is a change in the brain. And if you're traumatized, your brain is responding inappropriately to your environment. And if you can't function in your current environment as productively as you want to, you might want to consider religious trauma as one of the one of the roots of whatever that whatever your concern is. So what are the sort of effects of religious trauma that you've seen? How, how does it actually manifest as children grow up? Uh, what we see a lot in, in early adulthood after, as you know, a lot of this stuff manifests after you leave the house, after you've graduated from high school and left your, your home of origin, uh, things, sleep disorders, off, uh, that that's one of the most common ones. I can't sleep because I, I, if I go to sleep, I think uh, Jesus is going to come and, and take me away or kill me or whatever. The devil's going to get me. I can't go to sleep because I'll have bad dreams. I will, I will dream sexual thoughts and then I know that's wrong and that's bad. So I, so it's this cycle of, if I go to sleep, I'll have this dream. And if I have this dream, I'm a bad person. So I don't want to go to sleep. And it's just, you can see how that would, Sleep deprivation is not a good thing. And after a while, it starts having major impacts on your ability to function, period. There's, you can't go without sleep. And so these people are getting bad sleep and they're getting bad sleep in the name of Jesus, basically, is what it amounts to. Uh, so that's one manifestation, Andy. Some of the other ones would include uh, social fears. I, I can't interact with certain people because they're wrong, they're bad, they're evil, or I was taught that. Or or here's another one, and this is so hideous. We have people tell us, I was raised in a purity culture. I was taught how bad sex was um, and that I shouldn't ever have sex except with the person I'm married to. Okay, well, you've shamed yourself over and over and over again for masturbating, because every, every person is probably masturbating for years before they actually get married. And they've been taught that if you masturbate, it'll ruin your marriage. I mean, that's purity culture literally teaches that shit. So if you masturbate, you're going to ruin your marriage. So now you've been going four, five, ten years masturbating, thinking every, and it's a normal thing. I mean, you got a high sex drive. You want to masturbate. You have no sex partner. So you're thinking every time you do it, I'm, I'm ruining my marriage. So, and you don't even know who you're going to get married or if you're going to get married. Well, when you actually get married, we hear this all the time. I got married and we didn't have sex for six months. We couldn't get over our, our Christian imposed shame. And it ultimately led to our divorce or it ultimately led to having, we finally had sex and had some kids, but we've never had a decent sex life. And we hate each other because we're such bad, we're poorly matched. <laughs> So there's manifestations, whether they're trauma or not, it's a whole nother question sometimes. But these bad ideas about your body, I would say if you can't masturbate uh, guilt-free and enjoy your own body, if you can't enjoy your partner's body guilt-free, there's probably some trauma going on there. Why, why would a normal human being with a sex drive, normal sex drive, feel guilt about having sex with their partner or having sex with themselves. It's, it's that simple. If well, you've got again, guilt is a, a, another component of that process of trauma. You know, if you, mm -hmm. with all the other things that we've talked about, you know, you layer on guilt on top of that, that you may be ruining your, your marriage or you may be um, letting your family down or your community down. It, guilt is another component, isn't it? Yeah, it, it actually is. And shame is component of, of that as well. But uh, those are two different issues. I, I look at guilt and shame as kind of a spectrum, but but clearly different. And uh, in, in some high control environments like like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, 
they implement a lot of shame into their systems, whereas uh, Baptists are more focused on guilt. Guilt is, I did something wrong, I need to repent. Okay, that, we understand that. Shame is, I am wrong. Shame goes to the core of my being and my identity. If I get, um, if I have sex before marriage and the Jehovah's Witness uh, elders find out, they're going to bring me in front of the entire elders group or from a group of elders rather and publicly, publicly in the sense of having three or four people there, always male, of course, are going to question me about my having sex before marriage and condemn me and make me repent. Well, that's shame. Shaming someone is a corporate act. It's a public act. It's a communal act. Whereas guilt, I can be guilty of something and nobody on the whole earth knows I did it, but I still feel guilty about it. So I masturbate. I feel guilty about it, but I don't necessarily feel shame. If, if my mother finds out I masturbated or if my wife finds out or my husband finds out I masturbated, then I feel shame. And, and they're actually different emotions. I mean, the feeling of guilt is a different emotion than the feeling of shame. And shame can be debilitating. It, it can just, it, I, I, as a psychologist, I worked with people dealing with deep, deeply embedded shame. And, and when I see that kind of deeply embedded shame about their own bodies, that tells me there's, there's probably trauma there. Now, I want to be really, really clear, Andy. I, I, it, it would be easy for the, uh, people to listen to this and think that Daryl thinks that everybody who went through religion is traumatized. I do not believe that. No. I don't even believe a majority of people, but I do think there's a significant uh, minority of people who experience trauma. And here's the thing. Even if it wasn't you, it may have been your spouse. It may have been your own mother or father. There, there are people you know who are probably traumatized by religion. We get this all the time after I do a talk like what we're doing here today, Andy. I, I will get calls in from people and say, well, I just listened to your talk and I didn't realize it. But now I understand why my mother behaves the way she does. She was abused as a child by by her Baptist minister father who punished her constantly for this or that. And and now she behaves that way towards me. I understand my mother now. So that's partly what we're talking about here today i think we need to we need to be kinder to ourselves and we need to help understand what religion is doing to those we love around us including our parents because i tell you we had that discussion earlier you know just now that that what about parents do they think they're actually intentionally hurting their children no they may have been traumatized themselves by their parents and it's an intergenerational thing one generation traumatizes the next generation I have a friend who, who is the, she's the sixth, fifth generation, she, she's a woman, but fifth generation of Baptist ministers. And she was the sixth generation, but she was a woman, so she couldn't be a minister. So what'd she do? She married a minister. <laughs> so six generations. And when she finally, she read my book, Sex and God. Uh, years ago or not long after it came out in fact she told me she's read the book three times which that's very i'm very flattered by that but she read the book and she said that book explained probably what every one of those five generations above her had gone through sexually and oh by the way what she the sixth generation has gone through sexually and and now and she's and she's done a lot in the last few years to overcome that, but I think she was she was clearly traumatized by her own father. But then when she looks at her father and her grandfather, she said, "Oh, my grandfather, sexual or abused my father. Maybe he didn't yeah. physically sexually abuse him, but purity culture is just a it's a sexual abuse. Trying to tell somebody you're you're a horrible person for being a normal human being. That's what purity culture does. Yeah, well, anyway." A friend who's a Jehovah Witness or um, ex-Jehovah Witnesses out of the religion now. Um, and it's interesting you say that the not everybody who's in a religion, even if it's quite cultist, cultish religion, um, is traumatized. And I know mm -hmm. that uh, my, my friend is a happy, outgoing person. 
Um, he's out of the religion, but he has been ostracized by his family. He has been rejected. Mm -hmm. um, his family, every time they do get in contact, which is rarely now, always the conversation comes back to coming back to the church. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Every single time. And he doesn't want, want anything to do with it. And I've had long conversations with him because, of, you know, I'm an atheist. He's an atheist. Uh, and I've talked to him a lot about his childhood purely because of interest. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem like he's, he's suffered any, any trauma to the outside world. But having conversations with him, you can, you can sort of tell that it, it really did affect him as a child. It really mm -hmm. made him feel um, dirty, sinful, uh, outside of rationality, because the rationality of the church invades you. It is oh, yeah. Hard. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So even though he feels or he seems like a very normal, rational person nowadays and a very happy person, you can tell that there, there's the, the, the beginnings or the seeds of trauma that sit within his mind because it's a mental thing and you it's not something when you can you can just brush off no that that five-year-old child is still inside of him yeah he's, he still resides there and you know there's ways to mitigate that there's treatments that can be used to help him if, if he chose to go to therapy a good therapist will be able to help him with that but you never get rid of the five-year-old child the memories are there so you're not, you're not erasing the memories. <laughs> that's hard. That's hard. That's hard to do. And not even necessary uh, for you to do that. Let yeah, me, that's, let that's me. I wanted to point out that the, the, the whole concept of, you know, you, you, you may not believe that you are suffering trauma, but it, it will affect you. And, and I know that it, mm -hmm. it plays on his mind. Mm -hmm. It does because he's, and, and he's constantly being reminded of it from his own family and yeah. from the isolation he feels. So those are kind of triggers for, for the, the trauma to come back to him. Uh, I, I do want to make a, another point around personality because what we, it's pretty clear that some people are more susceptible to being traumatized than other people are. We, we know soldiers that go into war, they see a lot of bad things and they don't appear to be traumatized and they may not be, I don't know. And the, the guy next to that person, the other soldier just next to him, is totally traumatized by the same event. So what we know is that people, people are more or less susceptible to these outside influences. It's it's not unlike uh, immune systems. You know, I'm um, it, it, I, I may not get the flu this year, but my partner might get the flu, and we live in the same house and we're being exposed to the same virus. Well, it's because my immune system has some resilience against that particular virus. And hers doesn't. Uh, next year, it could be the opposite. Hers, the, the flu strain that comes through gets her, but doesn't get uh, gets me, but doesn't get her. It's that's the way things work. Well, personalities. There's there's five different com personality components in humans, uh, and four of those personality components have no correlation with religiosity at all. They they don't predict it or interact with it apparently, but one personality component does. And that's the that's the notion of uh, uh, curiosity and openness to new experience. If you score high on that, it, you're less likely to be religious. If you score low on openness to new experience and curiosity, you're more susceptible to being infected with religious ideas. So some people might feel very comfortable inside of their religion. Because religion comes with good, bad, black, white, right, wrong. It gives you all the answers. You don't have to think. You don't have to worry. You don't have to understand this complex world around you because it, the world is not this. The world is this if you're a Jehovah's Witness. And if, you, if you're comfortable inside of a nice cocoon, then you're going you're gonna to do just fine. You're not going to be traumatized. And I like to call that the warm coat. Uh, somebody who's uh, scores low on openness to new experience and curiosity is going to feel like their religion is a nice warm coat on a cold day. However, if you're a person who scores high on openness to new experience and curiosity, 
And these, these are people who like to jump out of airplanes. These are people who like to go climb mountains. These are people who are adventurous. These are people who question all the time. Why mommy? Why daddy? If you're one of those kind of people scoring high on openness to experience curiosity, you're going to feel like this damn religion is a straitjacket and you want to throw the straitjacket off. Now, I'm guessing, and I'm just guessing, that your friend was, was the, the high openness to new experience and curiosity kind of person. He may not be jumping out of airplanes, don't get me wrong, but he's probably the guy that asks a lot of questions, thinks a lot, wants to use his mind. Black, white, good, bad, right, wrong answers aren't satisfactory to him. It feels like a straitjacket. So when he throws the straitjacket off and frees himself from that religion, he gets ostracized. He gets disfellowshipped. He gets thrown out of the family. And so therein lies a traumatic experience. It may not, he might not have even been traumatized, although it sounds like he might have been as a child. But the fact that yeah, you've been thrown out of everything you ever knew or loved that could be pretty damn traumatizing to somebody as an adult. So therein lies another kind of religious trauma. We got the childhood kind we've talked a lot about, but what does it do to a human being when they lose their entire social structure? That, that can be very traumatizing. <clears throat> so I, I, I give that example because it helps you understand why some people might be traumatized by religion and other people might not be. It also might help explain why some people are traumatized after leaving and losing their social structure. And they, they may not have felt the trauma when they were still children inside the religion. Yeah, I mean, I think he's very much the uh, the big open type. I mean, he's he, he's the vocalist in our, in our rock band. So, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Okay, there you go. <laughs> proves the point, really, doesn't it? Yeah, okay, that kind of proves the point. But those kind the that personality structure, I mean, when people people don't realize personality is 50%, and I want to emphasize that 50% of your personality is genetic. Absolutely 100%, 50%. <laughs> and here and let me illustrate this to your to your uh, viewers here. You may think you got your personality through your experiences, and some part. The other 50% may be, but there is a strong, very strong genetic component to our personalities. And if you do not believe me, just go look at any dog or ask any dog owner or a person who understands dogs. Can you, uh, I'll just use you, Andy, right now. Can you tell me the personality of a German Shepherd? Uh, well, it, it, they're obedient and they're, they're focused, they're, they're mental cognitive processes okay. are, are to protect and you know that's what they use okay. them for tell me tell me the personality of a black lab oh soppy as hell <laughs> tell me the personality of a do uh, dachshund well the, the only ones i know they're just I, all i see is me trotting along and being very very happy in their little <laughs> world okay so if you uh you're probably not a very sophisticated dog personality analyst and yet i can ask you these dogs and you can tell me their personalities yeah did that dog get their personality from the training from her mother or from a dog trainer? Hell no. That personality came through the genes in the DNA of yeah. the mother, father together. And you're the same way. If you've ever been taught, told by your mother, your mother said, you act just like your father or you look just like your uncle. Well, there's a reason why you look like somebody and there's a reason why you act like somebody. It's because of your damn genes. So let's imagine that this kid has a genetic, uh, a genetic component of the five. He's openness to new experience and curiosity, and he's born into a Jehovah's Witness or an Orthodox Jewish home, or he's born in Pakistan among Muslims. He wants to be out and open and climbing mountains and questioning and reading books. And I mean, none of that is acceptable within that religious framework. So even as he expresses his natural personality, he is going to go against everything the church teaches. If his parents, who may be genetically predisposed to be low in curiosity and open to new experience, they're going to think they've got a rebellious child on their hand because they never did that. They never sassed their parents. They never questioned the religion or whether there's a God or not. 
So this, this conflict and dynamic, it doesn't come because I'm a bad child or even because you're bad parents. It comes because these are personalities that don't see the world at, in the same way at all. And that's, I'm glad they don't. We need lots of different personality approaches, just like we need lots of different kinds of dog personalities. There's not a right or wrong dog personality. There's not a right or wrong human personality either. It's interesting because the the when you know talking about my friend who, who's ex Jehovah's Witness, although he doesn't um, sort of come over as being traumatized, because he's, he sings in my band, you can, you can actually see it in his lyrics. You know the the the, the things that come out, the, the things that go into lyrics and poetry and all those sort of things and yeah. writing are the things that you bring through your life experiences and. When you read his lyrics, you can you can tell there's a problem there. You can tell there's a bitterness there. You know. <laughs> yep, I I don't doubt it. I I think I'll, if you just look at a lot of music, there, trauma informs a lot of music. There's yeah. if you look at the if you and especially if you read between the lines, or you know the story or the history of the of the person who wrote the lyrics. Uh, I think there's a lot there. I mean, we could we could probably say trauma wrote a lot of religious music too. I mean, think about this. The uh, the person who made a deal with God, you know, it's a it's a storm on the high seas, and the person says, "Hey, God, if you save me, I will uh, I'll build a church to you, or something like that." That the Ryman Auditorium in in Nashville, Tennessee, was built by exactly that man, a guy that that made a deal with God when he was in the middle of a storm on a boat, and then he was a rich captain and. When the, he got through the storm, he then built that church. Well, the rest of his life was colored by that experience. He was traumatized by by a, a boat about to sink in the middle of the ocean, and I don't I don't doubt that a bit. But the 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 Ryman Auditorium came out of his trauma. And then if you look at other things like Amazing Grace, the the song Amazing Grace, it was written by a by a slave trader. I mean, this guy had was literally responsible for the murder of thousands of people, probably. And then he got saved by Jesus. Oh, he kept being a slave trader for another two or three years after that. But he got saved by Jesus. And then as he looks back on his life, he thinks, damn, I did all that. I'm a horrible person. And he writes a whole he writes a whole song about I'm a horrible person. And and the rest of the world gets to hear how horrible. He was, and oh, by the way, you're just as horrible. Although I was never a slave trader. <laughs> I was never a murderer like he was. Uh, but Christianity can forgive that shit. But how did he deal with his trauma? He dealt with it by writing a damn song. Yeah. And I can see trauma everywhere in religion. Uh, everywhere. Look at St. Thomas Aquinas. Look, look at... Um, at St. Francis, I, I see all these so-called saints and they were abused. They were terribly abused sometimes as children. And now they're <laughs> seen as saints, but it, it was Catholic trauma that caused them to behave the way they did. And and I think their, their, uh, their religiosity is their coping mechanism yeah. for the trauma. Bad, bad coping mechanism, but you know, that's the way yeah. it worked back then. Yeah, exactly. Now, just to round this off, if there's anybody going through this, anybody who's watching this, is anybody who's going through what they believe is uh, some sort of, we call it trauma, but there's going to be, you know, issues, let's say issues, going through any of the issues that we discussed today, what do they need to do with recovering from religion, your, your organization? What is the, the process that they can go through? Well, get online, go to recoverreligion.org and hit the chat button or the call button and talk to one of our agents. Just, just talk to them. And as you talk, you may discover they've got resources they can send you to. Ultimately, you may come to the conclusion that you are experiencing, you are experiencing an adverse childhood experience that continues to haunt you as an adult or your child is or your spouse is or somebody you love, you know? Then we can help, then ask our agents to help you find, well, not help you, but to send you to our seculartherapy.org, seculartherapy.org. Register, it's a very simple process of registering. And once you're registered, you can then search to find a therapist near you if you want. A lot of the therapists now with, with COVID are doing um, 
are are doing uh, online therapy, tele well, like, like telehealth, calls and things like that. Yeah. Just just like we're doing right now, you can have telehealth right here. We actually have, uh, I think it's five therapists in the United Kingdom. So we've got we've got therapists all over the world. We got a therapist in South Africa. We got four or five in Australia. We got almost twenty in Canada. Of course, most of them are in the North America in, in the United States. But it's we have lots of therapists, and they almost all of them will be familiar with what we're talking about here today, and they can help you deal with that. Now, let me say there are protocols. This is really revolutionary, Andy. About 10 or 20 years ago, you might have to go to years of therapy to get over some of this trauma. But the, the new trauma protocols that have come out just in the last 10, five years, if not 10 years, are amazing. And they're so much more effective than what we had just 10 years ago, actually. Uh, and part of this comes out of the Iran, Iraq war um, Afghanistan war, all those, you know, the interminable wars that America has to get into. Uh, when, when people came back from World War II and when people came back from Korean, uh, Korean War and the Vietnam War, we had no treatment for what we call shell shock or battle fatigue. And as a result, people literally suffered the rest of their life. Well, when, when veterans started coming back from these wars to the United States, the U.S. government said, maybe we shouldn't treat people the same. Maybe we should find out what, what find some treatments for these people. So uh, a lot of money, a lot of time was put into researching post-traumatic stress syndrome, a dis PTSD disorder, if you want. And uh, protocols were developed. They were scientifically validated through all sorts of, of, of good peer-reviewed methodologies. And then starting about 10 years ago, it, you know, it takes some time to get this going. But about 10 years ago, we started seeing protocols come in that were working. We had good evidence for it. And about five years ago, a lot of the clinical trials were finished and the training was finished. And, uh, and almost every year since then, we've seen new protocols come out that have been validated. So the reason I'm telling you this is if you experience trauma or you think you are and you go to a therapist, be sure you... Um, be sure you you talk to them in terms of religious trauma and your religious background. Send your therapist to Journey Free website or have them look at the book or have them look at one of my talks because not every therapist is fully trained in, in, in what we're talking about here today. But most therapists today are trained in trauma treatment. So if they understand the, the roots of your trauma are religious, they didn't come from war or child abuse in a, in a more generic sense. It comes specifically from religious abuse. That will help them determine what the treatment protocol should be for you. So that's, um, that's my quick one for you. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, listen, uh, Daryl, thanks very much for your time today. It's been incredibly interesting, incredibly informative. And uh, and important as well that people understand that this resource is available. So, well, we have we have worked uh, eleven years to get this thing put together, and it's yeah. working very well. That we have about twenty, almost twenty two thousand clients looking for our four hundred and seventy plus therapists, and we're adding new therapists every day. And we've got therapists in forty four U.S. states as well, so we have them everywhere. So. Find somebody and they can they can help you. And of course, Thank with the beauty of the internet nowadays, you can you can get in contact from anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be in the country, does it? Not you're right. You can even cross international borders. Fantastic. Listen, Thanks Darryl, so much. It's been, it's been brilliant talking to you. It's been really interesting. Um and get in touch if you are suffering from any of these uh any of these issues. Uh, but till next time, Daryl, thanks very much for joining us. Let, me, let me do one last thing and make, make, on, sure people, make sure people know to take a look at my books because I deal with some of this stuff in either one of them, Sex and God or the, the God Virus. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll put all the links in uh, into the uh, into the podcast as well. So you'll, they'll be able to go to all of those things. But uh, okay. well, thanks very much for your time, Nick. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 84% of the 7.6 billion people on our planet are religious. Religious people follow dozens of religions and tens of thousands of denominations. The larger 18 religions have more than 1 million followers each, with the largest, Christianity, boasting almost 2.4 billion followers. These religions differ so much that they cannot all be true. 
but they could all be false. They are all believed on faith by people who are utterly convinced they are true, valuable, and endorsed by their God. What could go wrong? Unfortunately, a lot could go wrong, and it does. We see examples daily. We see violence erupting between rival religious groups. We see people engaging in violence to promote their religion and find favor with their God. We see gay people being beaten, persecuted, and even executed. We see religious minorities and non-believers being marginalized, criminalized, and attacked. We see governments and religions working hand in hand to impose religious values on every citizen. We see religious groups conspiring to have schools teach religious beliefs as science and to deny science that conflicts with religious beliefs. It doesn't have to be this way. At Atheist Alliance International, we say there should be a strict separation between religion and state. The state should serve all its citizens equally and should not favor any religion. We say governments should protect freedom of conscience and freedom of speech, not deny them. People should be free to change their religion or have no religion. People should be free to openly express their opinions on any religion. Education should be secular and based on reason and science. Governments should promote human rights based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In any conflict between religious beliefs and human rights, human rights must take priority. Atheist Alliance International does not seek to deny people the freedom to hold and enjoy their religious beliefs. Freedom of religion is a basic human right. We seek to eradicate the abuse of religious power, to make the world a safe place for people with no religious beliefs and a better place for everyone. There is a very long way to go. Our project is multi-generational, but we are making a difference today. We campaign on the international stage, at the United Nations and the Council of Europe, and we help atheists and secular groups anywhere in the world. We seek to normalize atheism through education and publicity. Religious people need to understand what atheism is, why it is intellectually honorable, and why there is no reason to fear it. We support critical thinking and respect for evidence. Faith-based thinking leads to closed minds and can result in bigotry, distrust and hatred. We promote critical thinking programs and we encourage open dialogue. We aim to introduce an Atheist Bill of Rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights does not adequately protect atheists. We anticipate intense opposition from religions and religiously affiliated governments, but this is on our agenda and we will make it happen. If you agree with our aims, why not help? You can become a member, or a volunteer, or you can donate. If you are part of an atheist group, become an affiliate. We will be stronger together. You'll find everything you need on our website. Okay, thanks for listening and don't forget we're on YouTube, so follow us on YouTube, just search for Atheist Alliance International and please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We're also on all of your favourite podcast platforms, so make sure that you follow us on there as well. I'm Andy Phillips and don't forget we're risen apes, not fallen angels. See you next time. Yeah.